All right. Uh, yeah, that's uh, part of our uh, Shutton's working group meeting. All welcome to. Can I undo one thing? Otherwise, you have to. Have I guess, can we minimize this one? Again? Yeah. Um, there might be a few more people dialing in, I believe. Um, I had a few more people in accepting yesterday night, but we uh, won't uh, wait for them. So, uh, can we just briefly on the phone say who's present? Which I just minimized, obviously, that window. But um, I think I saw Andrew. Uh, yes, hello. I was just figuring out the mute and unmute because one mutes the audio, one mutes the microphone. It's not as obvious as other systems. But anyway, hello. Okay, uh, Julian. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, good. Uh, interesting sound effects. Uh, uh, Harry? Hello, can you hear me well? Yes, it's fine. Uh, anybody else online? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, hi, uh, Nikos. Ah, hi, Nikos. It's Nikos Nikos. Uh, good. And then, so uh, locally here, if we just for the people who are online, if we just go around. Eduardo Pasca, uh, Ben Thomas, Stephen Hello. Are you guys hearing us okay? Yes. Most of the people were okay. Yeah, it's a bit, the, the people, I think there are some people that are further away. We, we can't, I can hear them, but, but they're quite faint. Okay, uh, put it slightly closer, the microphone, please all speak up. Um, okay, so obviously we're recording this. Um, we have a slightly busy agenda, um, starting with relatively brief overview on progress since the last meeting. Then uh, going on to our plan for the software, uh, this discussion on phantoms, and then very briefly, the planned uh, future activities that we have. So uh, I guess I don't really need to uh, remind people that this is a grant until March 2020, which is getting closer every day. Um, we've had four software meetings since the last working group meeting. And we have our two weekly developer TCOMs, and we have a few exchanges as well. Of course, if there are some slides. <coughs> our developer meetings are, are still well attended, uh, so that's great, I think. Um, also, for the one this afternoon, a number of people who uh, said they would come. So, it's all fantastic. Uh, we had conference contributions, a poster at PSMR from Richard. Um, I gave an invited talk at uh, CM on uh, STIR, um, but I squeezed SURF in as well. Um, this was a, a mini symposium there organized by the people from uh, ODL who we had initial conversations with, so they're still wanting to interact. Um, and there were a few other people there presenting their own software. Um, we have accepted just news on two posters uh, related to our software from Palak on the GE data and from Richard on his progress with uh, motion correction and parametric imaging and tech. Um, I didn't put David's ISMRM on here because I didn't have the immediate details, but something on geometry and so on as well. Uh, we had a PSMR school. Um, which Eduardo, maybe somewhere? Yeah. Somewhere. Um, we had a feedback uh, request, I think. <coughs> um, we didn't get too many responses. We, get, we got six uh, just after we sent the email. And, and then we lost track of it, I think, uh, and everybody else did. Uh, basically, we asked uh, a few questions. Uh, one is, 
overall quality of the course and things people liked it uh, but there are some, some outliers or people found something that wasn't quite right and I think it's more if you go to the at the end some people think that the duration of the course was quite right but some do find that it was uh, too intense so it was rather quick so they would uh, rather have a longer exercise part let's say um, the presented material i think it was uh, asked uh, and this is a gaussian distribution so if you score three you're you're good so if you are either sides you are either too, too easy or too hard so uh, it seems that we are not too bad in oh, you did you did well in choosing the the arguments and how you presented um, and then that there are some other things uh, to, re to rate the, the lectures and stuff but I think the, the big uh, takeaway is that somehow uh, we had um, not enough time for people to uh, uh, do exercises because we had to give them a lot of uh, information beforehand I think so some people had experience some didn't so it was already a, a complicated to squeeze everything every need inside so. yeah so I, I mean I, I thought it went quite well uh, there were the occasional hiccups but not not a lot we, we struggled a bit with uh, data size limits and, and so on uh, but overall uh, I think I'm quite well and also the Azure client thing was, was a very good idea uh, because that solved a lot of our problems I found it interesting that people wanted to have more of this um, it's encouraging really and, and I think that's important for future events and, by the way, we found a limitation of the virtual machine, which has this uh, 10 gigabytes hard drive, and by the half, half a day, we already filled it in. And so yeah. uh, Azure was a good option to, to continue the course, and then we later created the 30 gigabyte virtual machine, yeah. which is on the website. So that, yeah. It's um, Perhaps some of what they liked was more as a, as a teaching about an MR infrastructure rather than as anything to do with our software. No, not, not really from, from the feedback, but you know, six so is not enough. Sort of related. But it, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of, no, I can't go back to the presentation. Um, I think it, it was both, both sides were appreciated, and you know, some people were. It, it, it wasn't there. Some some people were saying, um, well, you know, but I knew all this at master, for instance, so I didn't really need it. But yeah, but a hundred people said, well, I knew all this kind of stuff, so you know, <laughs> it's a fact of life, I think. Uh, so well, it was useful to me introduce all the concepts because then they are used in the software. So. Yeah. Uh, my my feeling on on uh, coffee conversations was that it was actually very well received, but we need to get more people to give feedback. Okay, um, so we are we have some presence in other networks. Uh, CCTI, I'm a uh, member of the working group, and obviously Edward is spending fifty percent of his time in there. And then Richard presented at uh, the CCTI fringe meeting. Uh, where there were also other CCPs uh, giving some details. Uh, I believe his, uh, Ben and I listened in, I believe his feedback was that the interaction that we have at the moment with the other CCPs is going to be quite small, but the CCPR is very good uh, and we should improve it. But CCP, and they, I mean, they were doing some reconstruction of uh, electron microscopy data and there are in principle related aspects there but in practice software seems to be so widely different um, obviously Julian is involved in the PUK and the MRI 
Claudia as well. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, a bit of progress, not a ton on uh, agreements with the manufacturers. GE is the same as before. <coughs> oh, very good. Uh, Siemens. Uh, Talk to them at FNMMI, and they uh, have now agreed to release, uh, let us release details on gantry offsets and bed positions and so on, which before they weren't sure. So that's good, but there are still a few things that they have to check from the get approval from the MR business. And Jordan Jacobi is uh, very supportive, but they have restructured, and so he doesn't know who to ask. As it tends to go. Uh, everywhere really so uh, but uh, i mean at all all very positive um okay uh julian can you say something about the research exchanges um yes can, can you hear me yes um so since the, the last working group approved uh three uh, exchanges there was Palak who went down to ucl to do some work on the um the input output for the, the g6 um, and that's taken place. We're still pending the report from that, from that visit. Um, and then we've approved two further exchanges that are, that are yet to happen. So, so Johannes Mayer um, is going to, going to visit UCL in, is it the first two weeks of August? Or yeah, that's the plan. Um, and the purpose of that is to look at the, um, the simulation, the numerical simulator for, for, that's, that's been developed for uh, simultaneous FMR. And then we've got um, um, a visit from Ashley from Australia, and he's coming for a long visit, spending initially two weeks in Leeds and then six weeks at UCL, with two projects in Leeds. Is looking at um, uh, kernelized PET-MR reconstruction, um, partial body correction and epilepsy, and at UCL is looking at um, motion correction um, using a particular a, a novel method. Um, which, which is able to allow um, um, discrete you know, boundaries to move against each other. Uh, I think particularly looking at respiratory motion, um, and that exchange is part funded by the, um, uh, the, the CCP. Um, I understand that there still is money left, is that right, Chris? Oh yeah, plenty, even so, after Australia. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we, we encourage further applicants. Um, the details are on the website, the link on the slides. Um, the purpose needs to be to facilitate, to facilitate exchange between staff and students, uh, between institutions, one of which would be a UK institution, and importantly, which, which further aims the, to furthers the aims of the, uh, the CCP. And then there's details of what you need to do, you need to submit your proposal, either to myself or to myself and Claudia, providing a, a brief description of the purpose and the activity plan for how it benefits the CCP, a short CV of the, of the person who will be visiting, the cost of justification, and then a letter of support both from the host institute and also from the, uh, the, students, the supervisor of the student or the vice manager or the member of staff. Okay, uh, so yeah, please uh, let not all people come to UCL and uh, invite somebody from wherever, apparently even Australia is good. So, you know, please do so. Have money. Any questions up to now? No, everybody happy. So uh, again, he's going to give a brief overview on our current functionality for those who have lost track. Right. I, I would normally uh, present um, what what's new since the, the uh, previous meeting, um, but since I'm going to do it in the afternoon anyway, so I, I thought that probably this time I uh, present the whole picture, the summary of where we are three years into this project. So what we can do on pet side is a uh, few reconstruction uh, algorithm OS map OSL, OSS yes, uh, also OSL reconstruction with the OS prior, uh, that, and uh, filter back projection reconstruction in two dimensions. Uh, the last two are fresh out of the oven. Um, 
we our acquisition model now takes into account um, the inefficiencies, attenuation, and randomness, and we can do we can can convert this mode data into sinograms, and hence we can reconstruct this mode data. On MR side, uh, we can do fully uh, sampled and undersampled reconstruction. Uh, we offer our users a simple way to uh, create gadget, gadget chains uh, from script rather than uh, by writing XML uh, files. Uh, and XML format involves quite a lot of it's called um, boiler plate. I don't know if you're familiar with the expression, things you have to do no matter what you're going to do. Yeah. And in additionally, um, uh, we, well, our users can split uh, the whole reconstruction chain into sub chains sub and play with the intermediate data. That's something that you cannot do, can you possibly do with the XML files. Programming, um, we can uh, estimate coil sensitivities, uh, which we need uh, for acquisition model for forward and back uh, projection. And finally, uh, users have access to all acquisition image data parameters, uh, so they know which slice or repetition this uh, particular acquisition uh, comes from. So uh, there's also some uh, common functionality. Uh, in, on that side, we have objective function, and on both sides, we have acquisition model objects and also acquisition and image data algebra. So we can basically do algebra or images and acquisitions as uh, they are ve vectors. And uh, what this is useful for it allows the user to design uh, their own um, optimization algorithms or use third party optimization algorithms uh, for uh, maximization of objective function. Uh, on that side, you can do it this way you uh, compute the gradient uh, for a subset or for, for the whole gradient, and then you introduce a function on one a real variable, which uh, essentially allows you. To search in the direction of the gradient, and you find the, the optimal point uh, in that direction by, uh, in this example, by using um, sci-fi optimized at mean bound function. Uh, on the MAR side, uh, we do not yet have objective function, uh, uh, but we do have acquisition model, and so we can compute gradient uh, in by uh, forward projecting. Uh, reconstructed image and then backward projecting the difference between um, what we obtain is uh, what, what we obtain by forward projecting is uh, a simulated data. It, uh, this forward uh, uh, function uh, serves as a model of a scanner. Uh, so uh, we can compare that simulated data with actually acquired data. And if we back project that difference, we obtain the, the gradient of uh, L2 norm of different and then you can apply a steepest descent step um, now um, we have various distribution mechanisms for CERC uh, one is to build it with CMake uh, another one is to download virtual machine which has all software pre-installed except MATLAB of course uh, <laughs> same as Docker and um, Recently, we started instigating uh, using Conda for you know, distributing CERC. And we support Linux and similar operating system, uh, have some success with OS X. And uh, yesterday, I was able to build uh, CERC on Windows 7 so using super built scripts. Sorry? On Windows itself. Uh, no, no, Windows. Windows 10. Because that thing is available on Windows 10. So I need to be on Windows 7. Uh, Chris, you built on 10. I built on 10, yes. Visual Studio 2005. 
But this, this gentleman from Maastricht tried it. Linux on Windows, I don't know what it is. So that, that should work as well. Um, but the problem is that the Linux on Windows is a very recent Linux version, which the version that we have from the gadget room is supported. But when you upgrade, it should be all right. So that's where we are three years into project. Uh, we could probably achieve more, but uh, to remember half of the time we were struggling to, with the installation, across plat platform installation issues. All right, great, thank you. Any comments on this at the moment? Uh, so we also have the flagship, so I'll be very brief on that. Uh, Richard isn't here, but he's been working on uh, what he's calling Servefresh. It's intended to be in addition to Servo being incorporated, but it isn't yet at the moment. It is on, on a pull request. Uh, and uh, the interface between the two isn't quite uh, sorted out yet. But the intention is there to be able to call registration software from there. And, and he's used Nifty Reg there, but later on we might be having other uh, session packages. And he's used that for to give sort of an example uh, implementation for head motion correction uh, using standard methods. Um, then we got the contribution from uh, from Daniel Beida to to the anatomical priors from parallel level sets. So Richard has put that in together with a way to modify those parallel uh, sorry the, the priors thing, something that we've been working on. Uh, so that was presented at the SMR, and then uh, recently he's uh, put all of that stuff in the direct image reconstruction, which relies on the STIR implementation and is uh, work from Harry is by now the algorithms are a bit outdated but uh, and we, we just want to get something going where we put motion correction inside your kinetic modeling uh, inside the reconstruction uh, so that's that's all working we had to rely on some updates on, on stir and whatever and so therefore you, you don't see that in surf yet but it, uh, it will come there during the summer so that's, that's all uh, where we are with the flagship. Uh, some delays there on our plan. Uh, and th there are some questions to be asked on how we do this once we have that sorted out on the PET side, how do we transfer it to the MR side some of this way? And, and we don't have a good solution for that, but I don't think we, sh we should be discussing that today. Uh, okay. Hey. Just we just joined. Uh, so on um, our software plan, uh, I think given the people in in the audience here, uh, I don't think I'll review our uh, plan that we have on the website because we've done it before and pretty much everybody has agreed on that. I think you can have a look at, uh, well, let me, I don't know what it is. What happens if I click it? Might have been a bad idea. Um, so obviously we're we're at the one point X stage, and the things that we're doing now and are are progressing uh, is the non time of flight scatter for PET and the Cigna, and we just heard about the Windows side, and then we're sort of okay for where we wanted to be on the. Uh, version one, and then we go into uh, geometry and more integration between PET and the MR side. Some of these items have already been done. MR iterative reconstruction, we, we actually have that as a topic for the uh, software meeting later on. <coughs> and then our uh, list becomes larger and longer and more optimistic <laughs> as we go. Um, no? Right. So F11, we have F11. Yes, my computer somehow just yeah. And so now which window? Uh -huh. 
presentation. Presentation? Oh, it's not presentation. No, 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 no. That, that was top. Yeah, yeah, almost there. Uh, Left. 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 Left cope with as many platforms as we can uh, and I, I you know in, in the end I still think it will be useful but uh, on the other hand I also wonder if it would be uh, useful to be a bit more specific on things that we believe that it will work and document that we, at the moment we don't and that is the least thing we should do uh, potentially we should say no we're going to only target this particular thing but that's going to be hard as you say as you will see so uh, so I had some suggestions on here. So as far as the operating system and the associated compiler goes, uh, so the compiler, I would sort of say, well, you take the default one that comes through the operating system, if there is any, and that is really only on Ubuntu. Uh, so I've made some list here with the long-term support versions of Ubuntu. There are other Linux versions that where everything works, but uh, you know, I wouldn't. I suggest you don't really put too much effort into it. Uh, there is an issue here on uh, it really we need to have continuous integration support for the configurations that we have. And so, for instance, we want to clearly say 16.04 for Ubuntu, but Travis doesn't run that. So that's just such a pain. Uh, so that is a discussion that we uh, should have with STFC on their Jenkins support, uh, which as part of the flagship, we can spend about a month or so on that, those types of issues. So if we can have a 1604 running on Jenkins. Uh, Essentially, Travis itself, if you want to Ah, right. <laughs> Interesting, yes. <laughs> How many levels of redirection can we do, yes? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, okay, it needs a bit of thought, but... Uh, that's a, a good point. I mean, for the efforts on the SDFC, for the... Jenkins, it was uh, we discussed briefly the other day. It could be more profit, profitable to do it to do Windows markup or Linux markup yeah. uh, continuous integration rather than this because this we can handle doing sure. this kind of uh, infinite loops. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, w once we have our super built. Thing on Windows all running, we can run a pair as well. We don't really have to do it on Jenkins, but MATLAB we can. So, and and I do know that uh, you guys now have this. Well, Catherine Jones has the MATLAB license sort of available with uh, the for the build. For the build, yes. Yeah. Uh, so we also have access to uh, other mm -hmm. type of compilers. Right. Well, whether that's interesting or not, since yeah, and I mean, okay, so uh, on Travis, you can use Clang and so on as well, and uh, it, it's a matter of a second to enable it. Uh, so the, the question really here is if we if we should say to people, this is what we are supporting. As as soon as you enable enable it, you're sort of implying that you're supporting, and if there are trouble, then then we have to fix it. So in, in an attempt to reduce effort, it's a choice that we that we have to make, is essentially what I'm trying to say. Yeah. In, in a way, as soon as you need something new, maybe we can put into my to make sure that we're good. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, in all likelihood, anyone right now installing the software would be a big computer, they would probably have the Yeah. 
well, the first thing during the PSMR course is a guy who says, I have this wonderful recent version of Linux. Let me install it here. Boom. <laughs> because of gadgetry, you know. And then it. Pass away for a second. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, anyway, I. Okay, the, the difficulty ones, Ubuntu, I think we some, can sort of contain in a way. Once you get to OS X, it's sort of, well, the operating system version, I don't know, are people generally on High Sierra now these days or, or even whatever? So it's no point in uh, supporting Sierra anymore, is that correct? This is your impression from what you see, map people using that. I would say, yes, but uh, maybe not everybody would like that. Uh, no, Xcode is a bigger problem. Uh, it, it moves, and well, I think the even bigger problem is Homebrew, which doesn't allow you to specify a version. You just get whatever they happen to upload today, and it sort of breaks every every month, really. They change things and it breaks something, but you can't control it. Um, no. you, 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 only then. Yeah, on, only then. And then they say we don't really guarantee. You can't specify a minor version for sure. For some, you can specify a major version, but for instance, in their wisdom, they changed Drew Python to Python 3 as opposed to Python 2, which was a month ago. And then, uh, so. Oh, no, we can't build Python and all of that stuff on Mac. There is brew bundle and, and whatever, but you know their their architecture doesn't really support it. That's what I understood. Uh, so uh, anyway, from that I would say for uh, the biggest problem we're having is probably with Python. And so what Casper has been telling us, we should be switching to pip so that we can specify version numbers and then use brew as little as possible. Well, yeah, yeah, or, or, or conda, whatever, yeah, uh, sure. Um, so Windows, you know, Windows 10, every half a year changes as well. And uh, Visual Studio, I, I saw you on 2013. I, I definitely wouldn't want to support that anymore. Uh, so I, that's sort of my recommendation to do 2017 and do that. So, I, I realize I'm not specific here. I just wanted to discuss this really, what people feel about it. And maybe the detailed discussion we have to have in a software or a software meeting, but should we limit the things that we claim that it will work on? Um, it's a yes. Uh, I for my point of view, uh, as soon as uh, you provide a, a stable uh, virtual machine that has everything uh, installed in uh, the program that you prepare, then I would be willing uh, to spend more time to to learn how to use it. It it, it, it wouldn't be uh, such a big deal. Uh, uh, it's more important for me the science and the things that are are there so if we spend more time in ensuring that mr reconstructions pet reconstructions are close to commercial systems at this stage is is, is more important in my view but th once we achieve that then we can come back and catch up with the different uh, versions and the releases but uh, that's at least my my point my view yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's it's a good point that our 
emphasis should be in progressing the software as opposed to supporting it on very different systems. I, I would say by now we spent a year and a half on yeah. Well, some people did, and a lot of that effort is volunteer effort. It's not yours, so. <laughs> in, in, yeah. Uh, so in, in that sense, but obviously if we can get volunteers to actually contribute uh, reconstruction and whatever code, that would be better than uh, installation. I mean, the Conda business that I try to push is a kind of way to support more operating system within a controlled environment. Because Conda controls the, the versions of things that you install. So you can install Conda on Windows, on OS X, on Ubuntu, and then have you know build the same thing. You can choose the compiler now. Now they ship seven, two sixty seven, two I think whatever. I mean you can choose whatever libraries you need, and that will give you access to a, an environment which is the same in each operating system without us being doing doing this. Okay, yeah, yeah, I think that's too optimistic, but. Uh... <laughs> Can I handle my blood? No, it can't. So. It's, it's, it can't. Uh, what do you mean it can't? Uh, uh -huh. You can ins it installs in some directory. So as long as you make it, make sure that things are shared between MATLAB. And I I, I highly yeah. highly doubt that if you give some pre-compiled stuff on one version of MATLAB and you give it to another version of MATLAB that it will run highly oh, less. Um, Do you have data on how many of your target users use which system? No, we don't. need to make an informed decision about you know, which, which is the security. Yeah. It's not available. No, it isn't because we're, we're, we're essentially at the stage to recruit users, and so if, you, if you're going to ask who's using it, the, the number of users will be quite small at this point. Uh, but I mean, in terms of your intended population of users, the community that you are targeting, you know, yeah. and how we can ideas on what people tend to use most. No, we, it's a good point. We, we did. Uh, so maybe there are surveys out there. We could do it. Could do a simple survey that asks these type of questions: which operating system you really need, and whatever. That's a good point. The other thing is also what type of platform. Because okay. so far, I mean, I can run it on my laptop. Is that the intended use? If you want to run a serious reconstruction, would it be sufficient for science, or you need a, you know, a workstation or a small cluster? So this, this type of question was also useful to. Decide what to target. Um, yeah. So there is your well option. What's in the map? Yeah. Um, well, that that obviously. Okay, I'm afraid I'm spending a bit too much time on it, but I, I, I sort of. Yeah, I think a survey is a good idea. Let's try and do that, um, and let's then come up with some. Uh, circulate some example questions that uh, we put on there. Um, just wanted to mention here that we all know the Python situation as far as versioning is going to be somewhat traumatic. Uh, although you'll think it will work on all of Python 3 versions, but if we say we fix a Python version, then uh, maybe, maybe in Conda you can do it, but uh, that depends on operating system, I believe. A MATLAB version is going to be even worse. So, okay, let's do a survey. Good point. Thank you. Um, right. So, Eduardo, can you just say a little bit on us, our work with CCPI or your? Yeah. So, the interaction is uh, it's myself, basically, because I'm working at both projects. Um, CCPI is uh, CCP in tomographic imaging. It deals with uh, different aspects of uh, tomography, uh, one of which is reconstruction. Uh, and the, in the flagship, there is, uh, they, they want to experiment new reconstruction algorithms for multi-channel 
uh, acquisition for CT, basically as x-rays or other absorption type of uh, imaging. And because they needed to experiment new algorithms and create new algorithms plugging different uh, things, we came up with uh, two new Python packages to do to allow the flagship to proceed with that. So one is the optimization uh, package, which in which you can create your optimization algorithms, and it has functions which are basically the um, data fidelity <laughs> terms of the type of things, and then you have operators which are basically a positional model of the search. And then we have other things more related to the, the, the reconstruction realm. So we have the acquisition data, image data, and data processor is something that processes things. Uh, so what we decided to do when we did this is to align as much as possible to the uh, things that were developed in CERT. So we actually call the same the things the same. Uh, we have methods which are the same. So basically, we could use uh, switch from CERT to our framework without noticing it. And these two packages are independent, basically. Uh, so, um, let's see. Yeah. so basically, in the optimization, we have uh, well, by the way, there are iterative algorithms. So we try to minimize the cost function or objective functions that they have to make real claims. Uh, so that's the algorithm. So uh, maybe I show you, I've got another thing here. Um, we didn't go too much into the, um, we spent too much time in the cost function definition, or we didn't create an object for the cost function because we thought it wasn't very needed at this time because normally you would have uh, a cost function which is a data fidelity plus a regularization term. And normally you have a differentiable or non-differentiable, whatever. Uh, but then sometimes you have, so some algorithms will work with this type of uh, um, cost function. And and some others will work with something more complicated, uh, with three terms. So if, if you would have spent time in defining uh, you know, a cost function which can contain everything, then you have to unwrap it for each algorithm. So basically the algorithms for us now are functions, which uh, something like this, you pass what you need to pass and then so this is a function, this is the, the G terms so of the regularization term. Uh, and this is actually this algorithm, which works on as simple as this type of cost function. So basically, uh, so to resume, we have a number of new iterative uh, algorithms for minimizing different types of uh, cost functions. We don't have any cost function as a uh, software uh, uh, class. Uh, but yeah, so we can plug in different things uh, into the into the optimization. And we have for for images, we have a good deal. I think we have now nine different uh, regularization uh, methods, uh, which are developed in for CPU and GPU. So and they're all native methods. So I think there is space for plugging. Surf within this because it's completely independent. Uh, so I think it's actually planned for the hackathon. We will see it later. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have questions, just. Yeah. Um, so for those who don't know, I just wanted to, to mention that some of, uh, I think, uh, we're trying to synchronize terminology, and so yeah, it's on that you know, uh, using acquisition data and so on, and similar models. And there are a few terms that we now have to take over. But so the idea is because this whole Python that you can run both, and they sort of look the same up to a certain level, but there are maybe ninety percent of it, and that you could then use maybe a CCTI algorithm to reconstruct that data, which has a suitable one. 
uh, maybe another comment. Uh, this is all uh, developed in Python because it was quick to, to do. Uh, Chris asked us if we would be interested in uh, doing it in a lower level language like C++. If that is uh, interesting, we, we could think to do it. But it's not the main aim at the moment. Yeah. That, that ties up with our user base question. And I, I know some of uh, us in, in the room or on the phone really want to keep using MATLAB. So, you know, we can only use this from Python. And so, if you want to use some of this from the MATLAB side, then if you guys have XSS implementation, then at least we have a fighting chance otherwise. Right, but it's uh, it's useless to implement everything without nobody using it. No, no, I, I, I'm not saying that CCPI has to do this. <laughs> but yeah, that interaction might become easier. But also, we have to think harder than about how we do that interaction in, on the C++ side. We want Python. Uh, duck typing is easy. Uh, right, so uh, just... Uh, this is for the working group a reminder of a discussion that we had a previous software meeting where we uh, tried to set up uh, uh, different levels of code to encourage people to contribute to Turk. Uh, so that at the moment we have our surf repository which is supposed to be high quality software. Uh, and, but then people want to contribute and maybe they're not ready yet to be at the same standard or maybe we don't know and we don't have the time to all test it. So we would have a surf contributions repository where that gets in. So that's people contribute something there and then maybe we say, oh, this is fantastic. Let's move this over to the surf level. Uh, and, uh, but we do some curation and and some tests and we require licensing and whatever uh, but that's pretty much it and then there's a third level where we say well you know if you use surf but you can't really be bothered with any of this we will have a wiki page that you can link your stuff to that we thought was a sensible way to to progress uh, um, i recently did realize that um, the problem of the surf contributions repository may be is that it doesn't allow people to give uh, an easy reference to their work while if they have their own repository then they can so uh, it's, I mean, if nobody asks for it that's fine but so one of the things that is coming more is that people say i want to have a doi for my software we can do via GitHub and the Node and all of that stuff. Uh, they wouldn't have a DOI to their version of the software. They would have a DOI to serve contributions with their commit in there, but that's not very good. So, if I mean, if that's an issue for people, then I think this would need to be revised, and we would probably have to say. Uh, People have their own repository that they can have a DOI for, and then we use this as a sub project in their contributions or something like that. I think that one DOI per version release, though. So we couldn't actually just break the version of the company. Sure, but that, so yeah, so that's a way around it. But yeah. so logically, it might not be sufficient because after all, that DOI will then. Contain the 100 other contributions from other people. Uh, so, yeah. So, maybe this needs a bit more thought. Uh, and I, 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 although I hate the sub projects because they are really quite confusing and dangerous, uh, but maybe it's a better way. And uh, I think we should probably discuss this in a technical uh, meeting as well. I just wanted to bring this up, and I see people nodding in the room. Uh, so one of the, one of the issues, for instance, that we continuously have with Sir as well, is to say, well, I, I'd really want, I really want to get my paper out first, yeah? and uh, so that people can refer to it. 
but the trouble with that that it paper takes half a year or it takes too long and so if they would have their own repository with their own boi maybe that would facilitate it and the paper would then come and reference it of course while if they immediately have to incorporate it into sir uh they might uh, well they lose identity I think it will be a, a, a limitation because if people like to do something that they could point to a thing their own. Yeah. Is there maybe an intermediate solution is possible where they that whatever their contribution is that you can also section that off, put it somewhere separate that you can get a DOI for and then link it? Yeah, so I, I rather than you know that, that the DOI for the same thing but not sure. the integrated version, but right. a standalone version that can be seen there also. Yeah, so the, the only way that I know about doing that is that they have their own repository that then says import CERC, whatever. Uh, and yeah. Should they have their own repository to take their own DOI on and then they port the CERC? I don't know. So uh, then they also need they've got control over what version. So it's pretty to the paper issue. Sure. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think this, this might be going beyond like, the discussion that we should be having here with that at this point. If, if they have a fork where they do development in, can they have a DOI for that fork? Well, I mean, they have their own code, which they've got having their own GitHub repository to get the UI for. And then and so to run to run my code, you need my code, and you also need CERC and I've forked it here. Well, uh, they, they can do that, or what we should have, uh, which is on our on our to do list, is a way to specify to to broadcast. This is the CERC version that you have, so that they can then check. This is the installed CERC version. Yes, I'm happy, or no, I'm not. Uh, and they can they can in principle they can say, well, get the doctor of that of that particular version. And I'm, I'm happy, so that there's no no real problem there. Obviously, the more complicated you make it for people, the less it's going to have to happen. Uh, but okay, so I think this is something we, we need to think about in, in, a, in a technical uh, right. Okay, uh, on to phantoms. Uh, we we have about a 50 minute delay, but uh, so I'm. The meeting was originally scheduled to end at 12.15, so that means we're okay. Uh, is, is that a problem for uh, people attending? No? Okay, good. So uh, this is over to Julian. I, I don't know if you have any additional slides, Julian, to show. No, I, no, I don't. I, have, I didn't prepare slides for this part. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, so, so do you want me to leave this then? Uh, well, I think if you if you give the overview and sort of remind people where we are with it, because it's, okay. it's fresh in your mind, and then on the data license thing, I think I'll, I'll discuss a bit and then. Okay. There we go. So, so the um, the objective of the of, um, uh, of this group was to generate high quality, simultaneously co-aligned SMR phantom data. Um, we're aiming to get it from both the Gini signal and, and, and the Siemens. Um, with suitable characteristics that will enable users to use that data for you know, evaluating their um, um, novel synergistic average reconstruction algorithms. Um, and, you know, importantly, we have money in the grant to um, enable people to go and acquire this data. Um, and, um, you know, we, we've had um, Following the last working group, we've had two teleconferences. We had a teleconference uh, before um, Christmas, and we had one in January. And I think we came up with a number of uh, useful um, ideas of, of um, phantom um, um, studies that could be, phantom data that could be acquired. Um, but unfortunately, since uh, January, um, that has not been uh, progressed. I think one of the, the, the key things um, to, to highlight is that that's well, that's been, because I've got distracted with other things and have not 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 pushed.
push this. And therefore, if, if there's some volunteer who would like to come forward who's keen on uh, assisting in this, actually pushing this initiative forward, that would be that would be welcome. Um, particularly someone with an MR background, because I often struggle with the MR side of um, the fountains, which is often quite tricky. Um, okay. Yeah, so maybe this is an appropriate time to look around the room. <laughs> Okay, let's come back to that at uh, the end of all these discussions. Then. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. So, uh, in, in any case, thanks, Julian, to to initiate all of this and and to do a lot of work on it. Uh, I do think it's quite important and uh, actually very beneficial. Uh, <clears throat> we just need to be able to progress. Um, on the progression side, one, one thing that I didn't have on here, but can we make that an action item, please, is that we have email, we have a mailing group, but we have no page on the website, and I've suggested that about four times now, and that just needs to happen. Otherwise, uh, it, um, there is no visibility, and that means it won't progress. <laughs> Sorry? Phantom, Phantom. So, Phantom, yes. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, right, so uh, one of the somewhat uh, heated discussions we had last time was on, on data licenses and so on, and now we, we've had a few more by email. Uh, so I, I thought to, to have a discussion on that now, and I'm not saying we're going to decide, but I hope. Um, so um, I think everybody would agree that it only makes sense to do this if the data is available for other people to use, and it should be as open as possible. Uh, but uh, doing these acquisitions uh, requires effort, and I, I think Julian would uh, say it has to require effort because otherwise it's no good, really. Uh, and I, I think he's talking me uh, around. Um, so it, it's. I think if you don't mind, Julian, if I try and summarize your point of view is. You, if you, you can, I'll, I'll jump in if I disagree. Okay, if if you if you say, oh, I, you know, I have a funky phantom, I'll stick it in the scanner, I'll uh, do a scanner, I put it on the website. That's not all that useful. Uh, if you say, I have a funky phantom, and I, I describe how my acquisition is, and and I, I I have a specific aim in mind, and I document it, and I put it on the website. Well, that's not that. So there has to be some kind of effort involved in doing uh, those acquisitions uh, to make them useful. And therefore, if you do that effort, then uh, it makes sense to, to let people say, well, yeah, actually, that particular person did the effort. Uh, and therefore, a, a license that requires attribution for those types of acquisitions makes a lot of sense. If you say, well, we want to have a phantom, where uh, you just stick in the daily calibration one and you want to make that available, well, you know, attribution there, I still think it's maybe not necessary. If you want it, that's fine. But uh, so is that sort of okay, Julian? Or, uh, yeah, so I think, I think the important point is even the simplest of experiments requires effort. For that data to be useful, someone's got to make a decision of recording appropriate information about how the data was acquired. And that, and that act itself is, is intellectual input that needs to be acknowledged. So, I, so my view is the default should always be acknowledging the, the, the source and the effort of any phantom data. Now, of course, if someone decides that they want to give it away, they, 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 they can, but as a CCP, I think the default position would be people need to have a, a mechanism to cite, and I think a DOI is probably ob the obvious way, a mechanism to be able to appropriately cite access to data that we put that we, that we make available. Yeah. So, uh, the view on 
around these issues of other people uh, make sensible to say we do uh, suggest to have a license that requires attribution and uh, we also uh, well, I think I have another slide with, with guidelines and so on. I can't remember if that ended up in the packet slides now or not. Um, let's maybe come come back to the consensus at the end. So I, I had a look, as I promised, into the types of licenses that people use for data in general, not quantum data, but just anything, uh, because open data is much, and, uh, much more important than it was before, obviously. And what I could find were essentially two uh, sets of licenses by the Creative Commons and the Open Data Commons. So there's, I'll have two slides on those, but um, essentially the Creative Commons are around much longer and they were originally uh, intended for, uh, let's say, Wikipedia, yes, for, for things that you write or create or, or photograph or whatever, um, while the open data specifically was designed for data. That's like, uh, everything is data, but you know, they, they thought about databases and so on. And so when I looked at it last time, uh, there, it was a, a strong recommendation to use the open data commons, but the creative commons people have caught up in a way, so, and, and they now cover data as well. So they have, for, I mean, they have more licenses, but I think those are the ones that we want to think about. So there's a sort of a public domain one, then there is an attribution one. Uh, then the share alike is attribution, but you say if you make a modified version available, then you should use this license as well, uh, or a compatible license. And so that means it remains open. And then there's an even stronger one that says uh, you can't modify this stuff at all. Right. Um, so those are sort of the four plus. And then there are things that say, yeah, you can't have any commercial exploitation and so on as well. So they have licenses for that. And then if you look at the open data commons licenses, they, they really are quite similar. Um, so you have a public domain one, you have an attribution and you have so they call the open database license, this is the one that I talked about last time, which is share alike with attribution, but with some, some variations. So uh, essentially, as you know, at, um, for our data, I believe they are essentially equivalent. Uh, there are some differences um, between the Creative Commons ones and the open data common ones, and in particular, one of the differences, as far as I understood, is uh, if you have a, for instance, OpenStreetMap uses the Open Data Commons license because they say we have 10,000 people contributing to our project. You can't really have all those 10,000 people doing credit. And so they, their license, the o, uh, ODDL, uh, allows you to say, well, you credit the project as opposed to the actual contributor, which uh, the Creative Commons ones don't. Now, for us, I don't think that matters, but actually we do want not the project because it's not that way, data, it's just data from the people itself. So I don't think that's, that's relevant for us. Um, there's also things about distribution, the ability to write management uh, software and so on, but I don't think that's useful. Uh, or relevant for us either. So essentially they're, they're the same, I think. Uh, just want to also mention that there is a difference between the database and the data itself. And the database can have data in there that has different licenses. So the database is essentially the structure and the way you access it and all of that stuff. And then you pull the data and that might have a different license than the database itself. Now, we're not really proposing to have a database of all our quantum data. We don't have the resources for that. So I don't think that's relevant for us either. Um, so, uh, so having said that, um, the um, question 
really for us is if we ignore the differences between those two sets of licenses, then I'm going to go back to this slide, which has the different versions on there. And if we uh, can try and come to some kind of conclusion on what we would be recommending for people to use, so we can't force anybody. But uh, so obviously the public domain one seems to be out. Uh, so in yeah, anybody wants to comment about the uh, three other ones? Uh, benefits or what you, what you would prefer or. So Chris, my, my view is obviously we need attribution, but apart from that, as few prescriptions as possible. It okay. makes it more useful. So as you, you mean, uh, we had some sound pitches, so you say you need attribution, but otherwise as free as possible, correct? Yes, because you don't want to constrain people in how they use the data. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the share alike, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the question, uh, um, maybe for the phantom data, it isn't incredibly important, you know, but, um, but I'm not so clear of it. So if somebody would take the data and then they modify it in some sense, which presumably means modify the, the documentation around it because they can't modify the phantom data. Oh. Uh, I think an application where the share alike would not be desirable would be if you take somebody who wrote some, some software code which they wanted to get some exploitation but they wanted to use the phantom data as some test data within that, um, would we want to impose that they have, they have to provide that software for, you know, as, as, you know make it freely available? I'm not sure we do. Yeah, I, I, right. I, I think that kind of question is there. We obviously, I mean, this is a little bit, I, I think more in software terms, this is a little bit like DPL versus Apache. DPL says, well, if you ever use this, you have to use my license and therefore always remain free, uh, or whatever that we do. Uh, which we said, no, we don't really want that to encourage as many people to contribute as possible. So uh, on the software side, we sit somewhere between the CC0 public domain and, this, and the attribution one, because Apache doesn't require attribution. I'm not going to open that particular discussion. Um, but the, the share alike on the data does, does it affect any software? On the, on the no, no, it's just if you say, I distribute this data myself as a package, whatever. I don't know, some, some can't come up with an example, but as, as Julian yeah. says, you maybe have some segmentation stuff that you want to have data as input and you want to distribute that data as part of the package. How do you do that? If you don't modify at all, you sit in the CCDI, yes. If you do modify it, do we require that they use the same type of license? I guess that's a bit of a corner case. Uh, a lot of the data that I found is actually using the CCBI. So I'd be happy with that. Uh, so if did this anything, anything more, more you, you stop people from using those data. Any any objections? No? Great. So on the distinguished features between this one and the open data commons license, I, I think uh, a few sites that I found were using the CC license, and I think it's more known than the open data commons licenses. So from that perspective, the choice of common sense seems to be better that So, okay, so we have decided on using CCDI4. Fantastic. Right, so I, uh, 
<laughs> well, no, I know, but uh, okay. If you, if you, I mean, feel free to comment then, yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't really mind the idea. It's my only slight illustration of why I think by kind of being a little bit more towards share alike is if, if we, if we do create this and it becomes a, quite a large effort and lots of people start putting lots of things from a public perspective, then, I mean, do you, do you really want all of your data that you spend hours collecting that can just then be harvested and used for um, some sort of um, closed source package? Um. Yeah, it's the same argument. Yeah, but I, 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 I feel like, I mean, because with data, I mean, if, if, if somebody really wants to see, to make some sort of commercial package, then it's not that hard for them to go and get their own data. Um, whereas, I mean, when it comes to software, I mean, I think there's a lot more lots of IT and stuff related mm -hmm. around that. So I, I, I feel like. I, I like to share alike because it encourages people to share with the data. Yeah, I, I mean, I, That's just my I, I confess I have a little bit of a hard time in, in, in understanding this difference in a way because if you use the CCPR, you have to attribute and it tells. When sharing an adapted version, it must be indicated that it's a modified version of it. Uh, it it's, it's not that you just can just throw it away and say, oh, we don't attribute those people at all. Right? That is That remains there, but it's just that they can change the lot. But I think the attribution aspect is still there. Yeah, right. but, it, but you could make that license much more restrictive. So there's a couple couple of comments for me. I think I think it's always very difficult to envisage all the all the cases. And you could have a case where somebody does want a more restrictive license and it, it is justified. And you know, so so is this so is this a recommendation or is this a um, you know you know, people can give more away, but are we going to insist on people meeting at least a particular you know level of um, of, of, of giving data, data of, or making data freely available. I suspect we, we, it should just be a recommendation. And if there's good reasons why somebody wants to distribute data with a, a more restricted um, licensing arrangement, that we should enable that in some way. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think I think generally, as if we if we're conducting publicly funded. Research. I think we, sh we struggle to justify not allowing other people to use that data. Yep. So, so, so I think um, the share alike is difficult to justify. Um, I mean, uh, okay. Can I, yeah. If you take CC BY, for instance, can I then take some data? Scale all the signal with CCP values in the factor two, and then release it as CC zero. Yes. Because then effectively you're releasing it by CC zero to allow that. But you still have to indicate that you got the original data from the web. Except the person then takes your version that's released at CC0, they don't have to do that anymore. This is kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to understand what you no, mean. Well, I struggle with it as well. I struggle with it as well. I mean, making it free here is kind of weird. Making it more restrictive, that's, that's more obvious. That's, uh, and so I think the share of like is more towards Preventing people to put restrictions on it, but to preventing people to make it more open. That would be rather weird if they can do that. Well, I would, you know, I would have to get a law degree and uh, <laughs> read a license. Um, I mean, uh, if for the phantom data, I don't, I'm, I'm happy to say share the like is okay. I mean, uh,
I was happy that you had a conclusion. Now you don't have one anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, right. We, we fine. Um, the essential. I. I think as part of the suggestion and our guidelines are saying is that if you want to be listed in our community, you have to use one. Well, it's, it's uh, from share alike. Oh, if you want to use public domain, that's entirely fine for us. But if you want to have a more restrictive license, you would have to choose this repository. And couldn't they have any license to be in the community, but isn't this a recommendation of the person of ourselves? <coughs> I think it's uh, as 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 a collator of data, it's kind of nicer if there is some uniformity in in the license, it's maybe not required because then you can see it. Uh, let's maybe, when you do the Zenodo demo, maybe people can see how that works. Last thing I want to do is put the block. Just because we don't want to bear that block. Sure. But, as you said, it's a recommendation. CC Creative Commons, share like or, or more liberal. They are fine with us, and then any other things we have to discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, unfortunately, the Open Data Commons and the Creative Commons are not compatible with each other, uh, as it goes. Um, right. We need a lawyer in this group. Yeah, I mean, I mean these, things are, these, these things are tricky. So, uh, okay, let's let's have a look at some of the existing data repositories uh, and how they handle it. So, uh, let me start from the bottom one. <coughs> I didn't know if the Julian sent it around. Cancer Imaging Archive uh, uh, There actually has very interesting data set from there. Uh, and what they also do is they provide the service to de identify the data according to HIPAA and so that's fantastic. However, they only the images, they don't do raw data, so they wouldn't help us that is. Um, they use the CCBI on pretty much all of their data, but they do allow people to give extra restrictions. So they, I, I think 90% of the data sets from the Use the CCBI, but some of them say, and you know, in addition, I want to prevent commercial exploitation or something like that. And that's you have to dig a little bit when you download the data set. There is a tab somewhere that says, and this is the specific license for that data set. Um, MRI data dot uh, org, uh, David. Uh, so that was a web site that was well mentioned at the ISMRM meeting. The idea being to enable the sharing of raw MR data, um, and particularly these deep learning machine learning applications in mind. But only those, you know, those three data sets that were shown in the thumbnails were currently available. Uh, I just had a quick look now. I didn't see any explicit mention of licenses. It just sort of said you must behave properly when you're using it. Uh, that doesn't offer DOI either. Um, I just, the guy was running it, Frank, and said there's some means of accessing data via Python, so you could potentially have it. I was thinking, when I was asking the question, I was thinking more about the computer as part of your test script. So if you had it locally or not, and if not, drop it. If not, drop it. One of the interesting things is it claims to convert either GE, Philips, or Siemens raw data to the ISO MRD format. Um, and the web the code for this website itself is on GitHub. You can see how they've built the website. Um, the GE release <coughs> folder is empty because of the problems with um, GE. So they say that if you give the GE raw data, they will they can convert it, um, but they won't show you how they do it. Um, so I think the Philips and Siemens are just using what's available on the, on the 
kind of the only bias I have on the website itself. So I think we've got anything new there. Oh. Um, and there was a 10 gigabyte limit. I think you always know, always said the problem was a problem. So well, it was interesting. It's obviously got raw data in mind, uh, but it seems not to be greatly used at the moment. Hmm. You might potentially offer a route around the GE problem. No, oh, could even say you upload it there, grab it back again. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose you can still distribute it there and also take my license if you want to. I couldn't see. He mentioned a license. Well, just look now. He mentioned a license. Yeah. I'm not all that paranoid that you have. Yeah, we're looking in the terms of you know, you can just do your data. Okay, uh, so Zenodo, we, we talked about last time, but uh, uh, okay, I don't know where which window is going to open up. It's in here. Fine, then. Um, firstly, you're not familiar with Zenodo. Um, it is a collaboration between uh, Open Science, which is a GE project, and CERN. Uh, and they provide uh, hosting for pretty much any research, scientific research output. Uh, so anything you've got that you want to stick up there, you can do so, uh, and they will give you a DOI, uh, both for any um, upload, but also you can version them, so you can have DOIs for um, every single version of a, um, a data set or a publication, um, there, well, there are several different types on that basically. Um, so it's really quite easy to use. You basically just create um, uh, an archive of your um, your data um, and uh, and upload it through their forms. And you can upload about I think it's it's fifty gig per upload maximum. Uh, but they, um, they they then you can discuss it with them if you want to put more. Um, so I created. Uh, a Zenodo uh, CCP PetMR community, um, and uh, if we want to use it, we can put uh, data or anything else such as uh, code that is, uh, you can link through to uh, to GitHub. So if you do, if you if you tag a um, a repository in um, in GitHub, it will automatically push a complete copy of the code to Zenodo. Um, but on here, we've got uh, an example where I've I've just put the NEMA acquisition. We did, we did an hour long NEMA acquisition with the image quality phantom. Uh, and in uh, in the, uh, the zip archive, there, you basically got the, the list mode, the, uh, the mu map, which actually comes from CT, uh, and uh, the normalization file with their associated interval headers. So you could download this zip and, you, and stick it into the current version of SIR, uh, and uh, you'd be able to reconstruct these data. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and it has a button here. Open access. Um, it's a badge. It's a badge. Okay, it's actually uh, it's interesting. Sure, like. All oh, right, it says over here. Yeah. Uh, So, if, you know, when you upload, you can choose between about 100 different licenses. You can choose all the, they also they encourage a, an open license, but you can basically put anything you want on there. And also, if you really want to, you can embargo stuff as well. So if, you, if you've got something, uh, you're waiting for a paper to come back or whatever, you can actually put an embargo on it. All right. So they, 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 are, they will allow anything on those different versions. Yeah. Are you can use selective access to selected people. You can do restricted uh, restricted groups as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I mean, we, we we decided last time to go towards the and I still haven't seen any reason to uh, to change our mind on that. Really, I think it's uh, quite.
quite good and easy and maintained by important people. Um, so let's that's all good. Um, so right. I guess I think um, yeah. I think that's more or less what we had as far as slides goes. So uh, if I try and summarize all of this, I think uh, we're all happy to go with Zenodo. I think we're um, <coughs> happy to recommend the CCBI or CCBI share alike to people to use. Uh, I think we would want to provide a sort of a skeleton of what people we highly recommend people to uh, include uh, with some guidelines there that say of data quality and a description of what you're acquiring and then what we also discussed by email would be kind of nice to say if we ask people to provide a surf scripts that then would actually do something with that data and, and reconstruct it that would be a nice uh, way of uh, for us testing that it actually works and that it's useful and also for our PR purposes. <laughs> um, have I said anything contentious here? No? Everybody happy with that? Uh, the issue obviously I think is uh, how much curation we do on contributions and who is going to do that and in general related to uh, the initial question from Julian, is there anybody who wants to help more actively or even take over responsibility on the phantom uh, effort? Um, because, yeah, it's all volunteer stuff right now. So Chris, just one, one comment on that. I mean, my, my proposal would be to have minimal duration of, 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 of data. Now we may have a situation where um, you know, somebody is um, putting a load of inappropriate data or something that is a very low quality that dilutes um, the, 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 um, um, you know, the database of, of, of data that we're trying to build up where we would want to have some creation. But by and large, I think we would not want to, I mean, A, it's an effort, and B, we, we need to have something that is as open as it can be, that some of books and data drop down is useful. They, 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 they can. You, you might not be able to read the, the box on the right hand side there um, with the, the, the community stuff, but uh, if somebody submits something, you can accept it or reject it. But it doesn't mean to say that it won't appear on um, on Zenodo. So just, just just because we we don't necessarily want it in the community doesn't mean that, that it can't still be open for others to use. So it's, it's good in that respect. Are you going to restrict it to Phantom data only, or is it going to allow people to do computation data? Uh, oh. Then it could get a little bit more tricky if you say someone is sloppy with the anonymization. Yeah. It falls under your yeah. header. Have a very clear warranty to do that. Well, I mean, the license industry yeah. will give the same warranty and all of that stuff, but, but, but still, we yeah. show it. Small prints will still be there. And yeah. The CCP I uh, well, I was thinking we would want to postpone the patient data discussion until next time because with the GDPR, whatever, so many things changed, and I really don't know. Actually, uh, and it, it is it is on my list of things to. Do. GDPR doesn't apply if it's a but I mean, with Sonodo, I think even if something were in the community and it wasn't an anonymous or not available or whatever, the only damage would be reputational damage, not legal. Yeah, no, but reputational damage is significant. Yeah, it's all over fines and GDPR yeah. can are a lot yeah. more significant. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah it, it, it is. Uh, 
uh, uh, it's the, the community is a portal to other people's stuff. Uh, so you just claim any any right on that information to your advantage, of the way you say, but nevertheless. Uh, so I, I essentially uh, I would admit that uh, we are not going to accept any patient data right now, and that we will reduce. Uh, right, so, at, okay, so when people want to upload, it goes to at this point in time, then because we are crazy. Uh, I'm sure he wishes to continue to do that. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, and there's actually an issue on GitHub, because you know, the page where at the moment you can't have more than one. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but if somebody submits something, there's no reason why someone else can't check yeah, it out. So I just have to press the button that says yes to show them. Right. Um, because okay, so I think what we what we do need to do is to make that set of guidelines that we uh, were talking about. There's some stuff in the uh, and then. <laughs> Uh, that that set of guidelines will also then say how do we curate this data? That's if people have a contribution. These are the things that we are going to check. Uh, that's all great, and then we need to find somebody who actually does those checks. Um, now it, it's one data set per year. So uh, I don't know if this is something. Maybe we should sort of see how it goes. It, it might be a one per month type of thing. Um, therefore, it's not really an issue, and therefore, happy to improve it at least here at the moment. But if it becomes larger, then we have to change the idea. <laughs> So you are the guys who are being paid for us. <laughs> um, right. Then, uh, sort of the more, well, a, a question that I had on the Zenodo bit was can we, in the community, actually say these, these is the guidelines that we would point it to? Yeah. That has to be an hour. Right? So there's a, there's a uh, whole there's a couple of boxes that I haven't filled in yet. Uh, that have like a, a description okay. and stuff like that, so that, that's easy to just put in. Okay, and then we can do that. Right. Um, right. So then we come to the question on oversight and drive of the phantom generators. Um, that might be too much for one person. There's two people. I can say that I'm not looking for it. Is it possible to send an email to the people that is already there asking for someone else to be more involved to volunteer? Because I guess that the people that are there, maybe some of them are working in different things. Sure. Yeah, something that's of interest to the mission is they are working. Um, that's not a bad idea. But they now hire them on tech people, maybe? They, they, well, tech people, yes, uh, for tech spec. But I've never seen it. Yep. Uh, and you can do part time at hours, spend your day there. That's for me. Um, MR, last time I talked to them, they were looking for a person to draw their project and try to be high level and make them find somebody. But if that came or can't, so it's good to be. Okay. All right, let's move on. So Matt Hall, I think, is a DMR, DMR person. Yeah. You've been trying to recruit. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's based in the East Coast of Chernobyl. I was going to meet him today, but he's still not here. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I, I'm, I'm happy to to take that forward and then obviously with, with Julian. Um, uh, if you don't mind, Julian, to, to try and uh, come up with some, some of the guideline things that we have been discussing, some sketch to... Uh, yeah, I was, I was struggling a bit with the um, hearing the discussion that was in the room though, just. Oh. So I might probably need some help. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, I think time is running. I, I just very quickly show you. Uh, that it, you know that uh, Julian has a harmonization effort which he talked about last time. I just wanted to show you a slide from uh, uh, related efforts uh, from in, in the US, which I'm not so sure if this is SNMI or, or not. Uh, anyway, so they presented at the conference and uh, Richard, who was uh, attending one of the council meetings last time, is kind enough to share his summary slides. So I'll just very quickly go through this. This is entirely concentrated on the pet side. And uh, what they are trying to do is something like the EORC effort, uh, but then specific for the pet MR scan is not as wide as the ORC. And so what that essentially does is uh, you do particular phantom acquisitions and then you try and find the reconstruction settings such that the results are reproducible between the two scanners in this case. And that's an easier job than doing it between all the possible pets of these scanners and therefore they can make their intrinsically their, their uh, performance a bit better than, than the ORC side can do. I didn't get the impression they were thinking about this on the MR side at all. Um, but it is an effort that we at least know and we're, we're sort of talking to, if I'm optimistic. Okay, so that's it, I think, uh, on the data side. Any other uh, comments? Let's move on to future. Um, so, <coughs> Uh, was mentioned last time as well, we progressed a little bit. Uh, we uh, are, uh, have started or have been here started drafting a paper for this special issue that has uh, another number of CCPs uh, contributing to it. It's a virtual issue, so you can submit any time um, before what was it? March, March next year. But the year over. Yeah. <laughs> before Brexit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, we don't want to wait until March next year, obviously. So, uh, when was asking me, when do we want to get this out? And I, I would say early autumn is, is probably best. Uh, summer is not going to happen. Uh, but then, you know, November or so, to my taste, is too late because the software is out now. Maybe, maybe people are going to actually use it for some research, so we want to get those uh, citable things out there as soon as possible. So um, he will he will progress a little bit more with that, and then send a link around to people to contribute. Uh, it's going to be on overly for something like that. Yeah, not not too much. Um, so Richard has also been thinking. Well, and we have been thinking about. The first flagship paper on the things that he's been doing for the MRC. Uh, so it's also mostly about the software side because there's nothing really novel in, in all of this stuff on what he's been doing, but it's just putting it all together. And not many people can do that in the world. So, you know, that's just to have a paper on that. Uh, yeah. Not to say if you were something, David. Um, so there's this website called MR Hub, which is collecting together open source software. It's follow on from a previous initiative. Um, so at the moment, you've got for well, the ones in the screenshot, I've got some more you can't see. I think mine's just screenshot, which that includes gadgetometry, of course, if you're using. What's different a bit about this is that each 
thing that's submitted gets uh, reviewed by somebody. So it's when you click on a button that says full item and review, you get some text where somebody, they all seem generally positive. Let's describe a bit about what it does and how easy it was or not to install. Um, so we should probably submit to it at some point. There was some criticism at the meeting from some of the people there that they were submitting things and they weren't getting uploaded. I think they were a bit, might need to speed up a bit in uh, the way they handled things. Um, yeah. Seems like a good place for our things. Yep. Yep. Um, and second that. Uh, right. Staff meetings. Uh, maybe first one is uh, we have our two monthly software meetings. Uh, and actually, the, the dates here might not actually would not be correct. But the idea was to do it in September. And I think 14 September is actually an option now. Why it isn't before? Uh, and then the question is where? Uh, and you know if some people check and if pop out availability and any restrictions at all. So Harry, you were saying something about leads anyway. I guess he, he went over time so he dropped off. Um, ah. Yes, I, I was uh, suggesting a, sp a specific uh, week uh, in September, but I'm not sure if. Uh, it's good for uh, all of you. So it's the week uh, starting on the 17th of uh, September, but but I cannot make it on the 17th. So from the a uh, from that week, I was uh, suggesting uh, 18th maybe. Is there a specific day that you prefer? No, if if, if from a lot of them on Fridays, but I don't think it's very important. So 18th or, or 20th, maybe? 20th is even better, Thursday. Uh, we could have a quick look at the calendar. Um, both are fine. The, the 19th, the, by the way, there is a symposium in Belgium on uh, advanced image reconstruction. That uh, might interest a lot of us who have some of the 19th. So, I think. Um, 18 or 20, okay? 20? 20 is fine for me. That's 20, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, see an email that uh, Jeff Tesler has joined uh, despite a very early time in, uh, in Hi Chris. Hi Jeff, hi. Thank you for that, yes. <laughs> uh, I hope uh, you managed to, to follow some things anyway. Um, so the 20th of September, and we will show that later on to people as well, the software people should think that there are any. Restrictions. Um, the hackathon. Uh, I think we'll have to be really quite brief about it because of the time. Uh, so I mean, I, I'm I'm hoping that people are aware of this. Of it's been announced on the email, um, and so we have a, a number of items selected there that uh, Eduardo put together on the slides. Um, it's going to be a bit of an experiment if this is going to work or not. But, uh, so two focuses. One is really uh, get data from the GE scanner out, um, do the final bits together with Alec. And then the other is uh, let people see how easy it is to develop new algorithms and, and, and so uh, potentially looking at the CCPI. Um, so it will be at the RAL. Uh, we have a hotel. Uh, it's in a nice place. If you are into science or nature, 
Um, <laughs> well, it's a nuclear site, so it's not that. <laughs> well, it's nice walking and cycling around it. Uh, okay, so we plug them here. Yes, so we, we put it together yesterday with uh, Evgeny. Yeah. So, because the, the site is not, uh, it's restricted access, so you will have to register at the entrance. So we have a registration from 12 to 12.30, so I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think if we will have. I think we'll have to talk about it in the software meeting. All right, right. so let's do it then. Think. Well, you think about this num these numbers we put in because we have to look at the ventures as well. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, and there is short in between. Yeah. <laughs> Final detail, yeah. Uh, so that those registrations are out there. I don't know if people already registered or not. We will need the names. Yeah, not many risks. No, I, I mean, okay, let's send them on. Uh, yeah, let's discuss this. Um, and the hotel, uh, as you said, the there is 10, 10 places right. at the hotel. Yeah. So I need the names of the club. Well, yeah, obviously. Um, I mean, we'll do a poll later, yes. Um, okay, so two things still to discuss. Um, we talked about previously about doing some uh, a workshop, bigger workshop, and then probably associated to the IEEE MIC meeting in Manchester, and then also uh, David mentioned the retribution research study group. Do you want to say something on that very quickly, David? First, or not much new to say? Uh, all that they announced that they might to the next Madison and Random Conference in Montreal in May 2019, um, stop for people to talk about open source software. And they would have a call going out to the group to uh, submit to that. But I haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah. That was Mickey Lustig, the guy for the Complex Hunter. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think this would definitely be good to do. Yeah. Uh, no discussion there. Um, the MIC meeting, um, I think, made a, a ton of progress there, but, but the, the plan was to have both a short course and the workshop. And I think that's been misunderstood, maybe. That's what the Dimitris Suite is about it, and it turns out to be workshop organizer, not the short course. So, uh, to pick that one up. So, is it something from Harry who prepared that? Do you want to say something? Uh, yes. Uh, so, these are just uh, some ideas that I put in place uh, yesterday. And it is uh, very essential to decide if uh, CPPI will be also joined in this uh, because it, it will. Uh, uh, help us understand if uh, it will be only medical imaging applications or if CCP, CPPI, CCPI is uh, also interested in industrial applications, which uh, is uh, relevant to the NSS part of the conference. So the, that, that is one thing that we need to, to highlight as soon as possible. And uh, the potential titles that uh, we have in mind, uh, the first one is the synergistic uh, multimodal multispectral image reconstructions, methods and software. And uh, I, I, su I just suggest the uh, potential change into synergistic and multiplexing image reconstruction in the sense of multiplexing being uh, used as, as a word where multiple types of information uh, combined so that uh, we more or less combine the word multimodal and multispectral but maybe we we want to to keep the first title because it's more explicit than uh, people will uh, understand uh, clearly what we are going to talk about uh, any suggestions with the title so we uh, vote now or we leave it for later? I think, I think the first is better. I think you need that information otherwise multiplexing can be misunderstood. 
Yeah, I, I think it's also more familiar to people who ask the first time. Okay. So, uh, as I said, we, we would like ideally to understand if we will have non-medical applications. And I'll explain why later. Um, so the, the proposal is to start at the end of the MIC, uh, which normally is at noon of Saturday, 3rd of November, this, uh, in, uh, in Manchester. Uh, so we will start just after the lunch break and we will finish, uh, I guess, around 6.30, uh, followed by uh, a social dinner. And uh, I, I think that it will be very good if we invite some keynote speakers for uh, 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 specific plenaries. Maybe, for example, we will have three sessions, three distinct sessions, so we can have three or four keynote speakers, maybe one at the start of each session and one at the very end, uh, if we want to keep the people uh, staying uh, a little longer. So that, that, that is uh, obviously just a suggestion. What do you think about this? Um, yeah, I, I, I think the difficult thing around these things always is uh, what gets presented at the workshop versus what is at the conference. So we will have to be quite open about that with the conference organizers themselves. Uh, so yes, it's a very good point. Yeah. Um, that's always a, a problem that the conference people uh, have. And maybe that's something we can suggest them is that uh, the workshop is more closely attached to the conference program uh, by participating in the abstract submission. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, something that uh, I, I find it very good because then it will be even more uh, formal and the abstracts will appear. Yeah. Uh, we need to contact the committees to get the approval for that. Yeah. But we also need to differentiate what we're proposing from the conference. Uh, it, it, it is, yes, of course. But that, that, the, that can be done, uh, I guess, within the description of the workshop. Yeah, but it's key that we do that in a proper way. So, so, so why would people want to attend the workshop in addition to the, to the main conference? What will yeah. they be getting in addition? Because we are going to talk uh, more on a focused uh, uh, theme, which will include uh, not only novel ideas, but also implementations, uh, data set sharing, software sharing, and all these things that uh, I would say they're missed, at least from uh, the community in MIC. They're not so much uh, enhanced. Okay, well, I think, I think just, just in terms of selling it, that's important. So that, that's, that, that's, that's clear. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. Uh, I, I, sort of, I like uh, what you just said, Harry, to concentrate on, well, have a, have a, invite a talk on methods and whatever, but then have the software data sharing, those types of aspects part of the workshop as opposed to new methods, which will go into the conference, I'm sure. That might be a way forward. Okay. Um, I think we, we are running out of time, clearly, but, or we have, but, um, a special issue, I think, is also good if it, it would have to be to PRPMS, otherwise they won't support it. Um, yes, no limits. Um, I think what we need is a few people, small number of people, to drive this forward. And I wouldn't mind if Harry, if you are able to help there. And the suggestion would be to have somebody from the CPR as well, and, uh, one MR person. To uh, help organize topics for for the workshop. As, so it, uh, it, it will be good to have uh, as as early as possible a, a small team of people that will uh, 
move this forward because uh, the earlier we uh, make some decisions, the easier it will be accommodated for the conference uh, chairs, but also for the uh, special issue. If we want to go that way, it needs to be as early as possible arranged. Yeah. Um. Are, are there people that would be happy to volunteer from there or from remote? Not really. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, it is so. I think you have to look at it not so much as a uh, an SSMIC workshop, but as a CCP workshop, which we happen to do at that location to get a number of international people to come in. So it is hard what you set out to do originally. This would be November, yeah. I'm currently organizing two other workshops guys in order so that uh, not gonna like it. And I can tell I don't know how much I want to it's I think it, it's mostly sort of deciding direction and then getting people on board and actually come. Um can we cost to our tickets? Because of course. Yeah, because the um the long time. No no obviously not no, no. I mean, we have that loads of money, I keep on saying. <laughs> <laughs> we have about, I think, about 30,000 pounds allocated for workshops and conferences, of which many of these funds are. So, uh, there's a rule rule on the cheap then. Yeah. You have all the time to search for all the time. Yeah. What's the statistic on the price of our money? Oh, I think that's a 20 minute demo because it's not big. Okay, well, let's give it a thought and have some lunch. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you, Harry. Very useful. Um, Thanks. Is there any other business that people wanted to cover? Uh, yeah, just um, a reminder of stuff that we do. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you all for joining and especially Jeff for waking up so early. And uh, so uh, we, we will get the minutes up a bit sooner than we did now. So uh, let's aim to get minutes up in two weeks' time on the recordings. Um, so feel free to clearly join us for the software meeting in about half an hour. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Yeah,